Joining me now is my guest, Daron Brook, who is the uh, executive director and president of the Ayn Rand Institute, which is based out in Irvine, California. Uh, Yarn, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Yeah, you know, I just uh, spent a, a good chunk of the show talking about a, a, a law that is, I guess, being proposed out there in California, which will basically eliminate uh, babysitters, at least anybody over the age of 18, uh, uh, from, from working in the profession, which is very, uh, you know, uh, uh, typical of how the government operates. I mean, the government uh, ostensibly is out there to try to protect a certain class of individual, and then they write a law that completely backfires and, dis- and, and harms them. Absolutely, and you know, in California now, it has 12% unemployment, and this will only serve to increase that as businesses are moving out of the state because it's so prohibitively expensive to hire people, to fire people, to to do any kind of business in the state of California. Yeah, now I, I understand too. You guys, you're hosting a uh, kind of a, a a a symposium tomorrow that's uh, commemorating the 10th anniversary of of 9/11. What, what, what yeah. is the, the Institute's uh, take on uh, what's happened to the country uh, as a result of uh, the, the, the events of September 11th? Well, my view is that, that we misidentified the, the problem after 9-11. We misidentified the enemy or the cause of the events. We engaged in two futile, useless wars that have done nothing to make us more safe or more secure. Uh, we have increased the amount of surveillance on innocent Americans because, again, we were afraid of identifying, you know, who the enemy really is. So we, you know, instead of, instead of going after them, we go after everybody. So the country is less safe, less free, and, of course, you know, economically it's in a disastrous situation. Uh, very little good has happened since 9-11. Uh, in that sense, Bin B- Laden, uh, you know, is winning. He's dead, but, but his cause is winning. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah, and I, I, I mentioned it at the time that the, the real success uh, that uh, a Bin Laden has was in helping to shred what remained of the U.S. Constitution. Because of his actions, Americans lost far more individual liberty uh, than, than could have possibly been lost, uh, you know, after those actions. And, in fact, more damage was done to our uh, individual liberty uh, by Congress than by the terrorists. Well, that's, I think, the point. I wouldn't, you know, on that one, you know, Bin Laden uh, can be blamed for lots of things, but on that one, I would blame Congress and the president, not him, because the the kind of threat that Bin Laden posed, in my view at least, could be dealt with, could be dealt with swiftly, you know, ruthlessly and thoroughly without having to violate or to impinge on the rights of of, uh, of Americans. Oh, absolutely. Uh, but and my this, point... This should, have been, this should have been done, this should have been over with by now. We should be, you know, we should have destroyed the enemy and gone on, and that's not something that happened. No, my point is really that, Ob- that bin Laden provided Congress with the cover yes. to do what they wanted to do anyway, but they lacked the catalyst. Without the threat of terrorism, they never could have convinced Americans to surrender so many rights. They never could have passed all this legislation if they didn't have that bin Laden threat, uh, you know, uh, hanging over uh, the, the, the country. I think you're right. I mean, whether whether they would have wanted to do it anyway or not, you know, it depends how how uh, how evil you think those guys are. Well, you know, but generally we agree on that one. Um, but well, I don't yeah, know if it's I, out of evil. I, they, a lot of these politicians just believe they're socialists. They just believe that the more power that we invest in government, uh, the more uh, 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 you know benefits society is going to have. They 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 look well, at you, see, you know. see, I don't I don't think I think I think the two kinds of them. You see, I don't I don't think the the type of politician Obama and, and some of these people in the left in particular. I don't believe the socialists. I think that's way too good of a word for them. Socialism actually believes that you're you're moving towards a better place. You're moving towards some kind of progress, human happiness, whatever. They're wrong, but they believe that. These people don't believe that. These people, are, you know, are, are egalitarians. They're out for equality for the sake of equality. If we all suffer and if the economy goes to hell, they don't really care as long as they get their agenda passed. In that sense, they're much worse than socialists. Yeah. So, in, yeah, I guess the socialists, the, the goal then <laughs> is to spread the is to, is to spread the wealth around. But what they want to do is spread the poverty around and just absolutely. I mean, they, 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 socialists. 
believe at least in progress. If you remember the old socialists, the old left, believed in industrialization. They believed in progress. They believed we'd all be better off if we were just more equal. These people know we won't be better off because they've seen socialism in action. They know we'll all be worse off because they've seen, for example, socialized medicine and how it works. But they still do it because, because equality is more important to them than, than human prosperity and human success. Except, of course, they still value their own uh, material comforts. A lot of the liber limousine liberals, as you know, you might like to call them, you know, uh, you know, they might want to. Uh, they want everybody else to suffer, but they 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 want to somehow exempt themselves. Well, it's always the case that kind of the the, the elite that that is going to tell us how to live our lives and and what's good for us. They need their comforts in order to be able to you know stay sharp enough to be able to manage our life for us. Uh, they, you know, if they had to give up those comforts, how would they take care of us? So uh, that's always the pattern in history. Um, and, you know, it goes back to Plato, uh, the philosopher kings that rule over the people and, and tell them how they should behave and what professions they should have and what kind of health care they should get and what's good for them because we're, we're just too dumb to take care of ourselves. Yeah. Now, I know you've been saying that, you know, Ayn Rand's uh, philosophies have, have been making a comeback, at least uh, in, in, among the, the, the general population, uh, not so much uh, among legislatures. But yeah. I certainly, I, I don't know if you heard, I'm sure you did actually heard uh, the, the Jimmy Hoffa speech the other day, uh, where, you know, he really called on President Obama to enlist the workers in a war. Uh, on the Tea Party, or more importantly, a war on employers that you know the, they, they need to, the workers need to take what's theirs and take what's right, and the government needs to. I mean, it really sounded like a radical call that you might have, you know, the cry that you might have heard in the, the communist revolution in the Soviet Union or China or Cuba, and really made me think of uh, you know Atlas Shrugged and just you know really wanting to see you know you know wh why don't the employers just concede the war and just stop hiring completely and just take their capital and take their hard work and and either retire or take it to another country and just let the jimmy hot let that let them win concede no i i you know that is the story of alice shrugged and of course if they did that you know life in america would be intolerable very very quickly things would deteriorate and fall apart very very quickly and people would would uh, you know hopefully would then appreciate the value of the capitalists and the, the managers and the CEOs and the entrepreneurs and the people who who create the vast wealth in this country. Part of the challenge for them is where do they go? That is, uh, you know, it's not like there's some uh, gold sculpture like there is in the book where you can go and actually be free. We live in a world where almost everywhere the creators, the entrepreneurs are being oppressed. Uh, well, it it's all it's it's all a, a, a matter of degree. There are plenty of places that people can go and be relatively freer than they are here. Anyway, we'll continue this discussion after the break. You're listening to The Peter Schiff Show here on ShiffRadio.com. The Peter Schiff Show. Since the Peter Schiff Show was last on the air, the national debt added another $7.89 million. Luckily, Peter's intelligence is growing twice as fast. That's incredible. Welcome back to your source of sanity in an insane world. It's the Peter Schiff Show. are back and we're talking with Johan Brooks of the Ayn Rand Institute. And you know, Johan, it's it really is a, 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 a matter of degree. You know, you mentioned a lot of companies are leaving California. I mean many of those com companies are going to other states which are certainly not completely free, but they're less oppressive uh, than than California. And you know, I have a company, one of my California companies, Euro Pacific Asset Management I'm moving out of California as well, but I'm moving out of the country too. I'm moving the business to Singapore uh, because there's a lot more freedom over there. It's not perfect, but it's better than what we got here. Sure, but you know, people are, people weigh different parameters. I mean, the fact what amazes me every day is is how much business is staying in California and growing in California in spite of everything. So. You know, the calculation is difficult. You can move to Singapore, but you really want to live in Singapore. Uh, you know, there are not that many places that are attractive to live in where, that are freer than the United States, unfortunately. I mean, it would be wonderful if they were. Um, well, California is lucky that it has such good weather. I mean, if, they, if, exactly. if California had bad weather, there'd be nobody there. 
I agree. And, and it has great infrastructure. I mean, one of the reasons Silicon Valley thrives is because everybody's already there, so, it, it, you know, it's hard to leave. Uh, you, you know, you create a certain uh, economy to scale when you when you have all the technology companies in one place, plus Stanford University. But, but yeah, I know, absolutely. It, economically, it does not make sense to stay in California. Uh, and economically, what's happening in the United States is completely insane. And, and what's happening in Europe is completely insane. Yeah, and, I mean, I, I like California. Up, we're imploding. I, yeah, I lived there for a long time, and the main the main reason I guess I would I'm not moving back is because of the the, the taxes and the regulation, and that's you know uh, that's what's keeping me out. But ultimately, I do think that you know as all the jobs more and more jobs disappear, a lot of people will have no choice. They'll have to leave California if they want to get a job. I think you're right, and I think that uh, you know things are going to get a lot worse before they get better. Because, uh, you know, experience doesn't really teach people, uh, particularly politicians. Things have to get very, very bad before they, they enact even semblance of, of, uh, of sane policies. And, and there's, there's just no way for them to get out of this. I mean, if you think of how many dollars the state of California is under, you know, underwater, and then, it, you know, the pension plans in California are all bankrupt uh, in, in kind of dramatic fashion. We're talking about at least half a trillion dollars. Um, it's going to it's gonna take massive restructuring to bring yeah. sanity and, back. And the problem is it, it can't just get a little bit worse. It has to get a lot worse because when it gets a little bit worse, they just want more of the same. Like I keep hearing people, you know, they want more stimulus because they're still convinced yeah. the last stimulus worked. Even though, even though we're right back in the ditch, they think that, well, you know, we need more of this. So it's not until it's such yeah. an abysmal failure, there's so much pain, that they might even question the fact that their cures are actually the problems. I, I agree. And I, but I don't actually think they think that. You see, again, I think they're much worse than you do. I, I don't think they think that the stimulus works. I think they know that the stimulus is the only way for them to gain more power, uh, whether it works or not. I mean, these guys can't be as... That's stupid, right? I mean, we know, and, and the facts of reality are, that stimulus has never, ever, ever worked in the history of mankind. They always make things worse, not better. And, it, you know, the empirical facts are out there for anybody who's yeah. semi-honest. The discover. problem. These people are not honest. It's, the problem with the stimulus is it creates the temporary illusion that things are getting better. And so people actually buy into it. But then when the illusion wears off and you and, and, and what's revealed is that you're in worse shape, people still don't make the connection that the, the effects of the stimulus were never real in the first place and that the reason that the economy is now back in trouble is because of the secondary effects of that stimulus. But uh, I do believe that there are a lot of people that believe in it. There are probably some people uh, that, that, that know it's, uh, it's bull and they, you know, they, they, they want to get reelected and they know that uh, you know, promising something for nothing is the way to do it. But probably a lot of people out in America still believe uh, that government yeah. programs could improve their lives. And I think many of the common people do. But, but you know, the, the economists who preach this stuff, they know they know this is not true. Deep down they do. I mean, they're evading, they're ignoring the facts on purpose because it's convenient, because, you know, ch challenging stimulus which, uh, you know, would challenge much of what they believe about the world, and they're not right, willing but, to actually challenge that. They but I think, Yaron, I don't think it's that – I, I think they actually don't believe it. I think it's kind of like a cognitive dissonance. I mean, look, I, I mean, I went through this during the housing bubble. You know, I never had more arguments with people than when I told them that housing prices were going to go down. And these were otherwise intelligent people, and believe me – they were 100% convinced that it was impossible, that real estate prices could never fall, let alone fall by the degree to which I explained. And, and certainly in California where you're living, where prices have been basically halved, people, it, it, and, and I think that people were just shutting their eyes to reality because it was the, the prospect of their house going down in value was so destructive to everything that they were about that they simply shut off from the possibility that that was true, and they built up a wall. And I think a lot of these economists, they don't want to repudiate their entire life's work, everything they've studied. And so they simply close their mind to any evidence that would suggest that what they believe is false, and they just believe in it like, like a dogma, like a religion. I agree. I agree completely. I mean, I think, that, I think that's exactly that evasion. They put, up, they put up a cognitive wall. They don't think. 
uh, and they ignore reality and they ignore facts. Uh, you know, I don't think that's necessarily true of the common American who's just being bamboozled, but I think anybody who's a professional, anybody, and including the politicians, anybody who knows a little bit about history and a little bit of economics knows that these things, I mean, just look at Japan. Uh, you've talked about this. There's Japan for the last 30 years. Look at the Great Depression. These things never work. Uh, and, and ultimately, they only dig you into a deeper and deeper holes and, and create a bigger and bigger mess. Yeah, and the crazy uh, thing is you have these glaring examples where government stimulus doesn't work, like the Great Depression, like Japan, yet yeah. the people that are proposing more stimulus cite those, those examples as proof that stimulus works because they claim that the Depression was the fault of laissez-faire capitalism, that we didn't have enough right. stimulus. <laughs> And, and, you know, they'll always say, well, the stimulus wasn't big enough in Japan, right? Uh, I mean, uh, yes, I think, that, I think that's where, they, where it becomes really dishonest. Um, these guys are trying to, trying to really fool the American people on a massive scale. Right, but I and think, it, they've, I think they've succeeded in fooling you – know, I think they've succeeded in fooling themselves. I mean, I believe that Paul Krugman – believes what he's saying. I see him on television. He seems like he's a sincere guy. He actually believes what he's saying. I don't think he's lying. I just think he's that ignorant. I think he's lying to himself. I, I think he's, as you said, he's created this cognitive wall where he's, he's ignoring stuff. But that, to me, is the worst form of lying. Ignoring facts, ignoring reality, putting yourself into this in, onto these blinders, that is the worst form of dishonesty. But I think it's, ha it's, it's happening on a subconscious level. I don't think he has any idea it's happening because it's his own body trying to protect himself from the, the ugly realization that his entire life has been a fraud, that everything he's studied has been wrong. Everything he thinks, he, he thinks he's going to save the world with his knowledge of economics. He's condemning the world based on his lack of knowledge of economics. Cognitively, you're right, but I, I, I cannot believe deep down he doesn't know he's full of it. Uh, the body sends you signals. When you're shutting down like that, when you're invading reality, you've got lots of signals that what you're doing is wrong and bad. And what these people yeah. do is they ignore it. Some of us change. Some of us have bad ideas at some point in life. Yeah. And we look around and we see evidence of the contrary and we stick to our guns. But after a while, we, we open our eyes and look at the facts and change. And these guys won't, in spite of the evidence, in spite of everything, yeah. and they know it deep down. Yeah. And, and I don't know. It's, I, it's well, tough to figure it out. I mean, it's always, are they lying or are they ignorant or is it a combination of both? It's, it's always hard to tell, but it's an interesting discussion nonetheless. Anyway, Yarn, hey, thanks a lot for coming on the show, and I really appreciate the work that you're doing in spreading the word of freedom in Ayn Rand uh, in, to the, uh, America, and hopefully one day we will return to those principles. Anyway, everybody else, we will be returning back to the Peter Schiff Show after this break, so stick around. I will go right back to the phones. So when I take him my last in hand, and if him slip, I gone with him hand. The I'm Peter Schiff Show. We now return to the Peter Schiff Show. Call in now, 855-4-SHIFT. That's 855-472-4433. Rebel Radio, the Peter Schiff Show. And we are back. This is Peter Schiff here at ShiffRadio.com, and you know, the markets are continuing to be strong. The Dow, as we speak, up 180 points, but it's not just stocks that are going up. Uh, commodity prices are rising. Oil is up better than $3 a barrel at 89.20 per barrel. In fact, we're almost, or I think we're just about at the highest level for oil since August 4th, better than a one-month high. In fact, during the, la during the last month and a half, the price of oil has held up a lot better than the stock market during this correction. And, in fact, if we close at this level, I think that would constitute a breakout. I think short-term that would send oil prices back up to at least $92, $93 a barrel. And if we break above there, if we close above 93 that would break a downtrend that's been in place since May uh, where oil prices touched $113 a barrel. And we break that downtrend, I think we're going right back above 100 I think oil could easily be back above 100 before the stock market gets anywhere near where it was the last time oil prices were at 100. Also, uh, metals are still under pressure, but they are rising. Silver near the high of the day, down just 80 cents. Gold now down just under 60 bucks, uh, having been down uh, over 75 earlier in the day. And the gold stocks have cut their losses in half. 
Gold stocks now only down 1%, even though gold prices are down 3 and a third percent. In fact, there are several gold companies that are already in the green on the day. Again, this outperformance uh, continues uh, with the mining stocks. You know, also during the break, I heard a, a, a news report reminded me, I forgot to address this comment about the post office about to get a federal bailout. Apparently, they had a $5 billion payment that they needed to make that they didn't have the money. And they're going to get some kind of government bailout. A stopgap measure is going to be announced to keep them solvent for a few more months. And then there's going to be a bigger bailout of the post office. And, of course, there are many problems with the post office, number one being that it's government run. And so it's completely inefficient. Uh, you know, 90 percent, I think, of the costs are labor related. It's a complete joke. Uh, but one of the other reasons that the post office is, is losing a lot of money is because Congress won't let them raise the price of a stamp. And the reason they won't do that is because they want to maintain the illusion there's no inflation. And if they allowed a big increase in the price of a stamp, that would be a great example of the inflation that's out there. And so they do not are not allowing the post office to raise the price of a stamp. Meanwhile, the cost of delivering the mail are going through the roof. Uh, think about all the gas that all these little postal cars are using, driving all around delivering the mail. And so they're not allowing them to do that. Meanwhile, I commented before I actually wrote a commentary on these forever stamps. The one place that the post office is taking a lot of money is by selling these forever stamps that you can use no matter how high the price of stamps ultimately goes. I think these are a ticking time bomb. They are enormous liabilities that are off the books of the post office because one day Congress is going to let them raise the price of a stamp and then no one's going to buy any. They're simply going to use the forever stamps. And then Congress is, then the post office got to deliver all this mail for free because they would have already collected and spent the money yet they haven't made any deliveries so this is a huge uh, accident waiting to happen you know one of the things that they're saying they want to do is eliminate saturday mail delivery they want to cut back on services i don't know if a lot of people remember this uh, uh but you know at one time not only did the post office deliver on saturday but they delivered twice a day you know, back when, uh, you know, my father was younger, my you know, there was always uh, two mails. There was the morning mail and the afternoon mail. In fact, if you're watching a movie, you know, from the 1950s or even 1960s, you'll hear, you'll hear them talk about what's in the morning mail. Did we get the afternoon mail? The post office actually made two separate deliveries a day. So they've already dramatically cut back on service. I mean, normally in a free market, the service improves over time. The quality gets better. But in a government-run monopoly, the quality of the service is, is, is constantly diminished as the cost goes up. I mean, the post office is a glaring example of the failure of government to do anything, even something as simple as deliver the mail, yet we want to turn over the entire health care uh, industry into the equivalent of the post office. Anyway, let me go back to the phones. Unfortunately, what happened to all my callers? I guess a lot of people lost patience and dropped out. So if you want to call back up, uh, uh, 855 4 shift, uh, I'll, I'll return to the one remaining caller that I have. So it's easy. If you want to call in, we've got an open board. Uh, but uh, first up is uh, Manuel calling from Portugal. Welcome to the show. Uh, hello, Mr. Schiff. Uh, hello. I'm calling for um, just uh, thinking about it. I mean, I have a banking account. And it's not easy for me to withdraw the money from this bank for for a few reasons. But I'm really getting scared about the banking situation in, in Portugal and in Europe. And I would like to, you know, take uh, some bullion and uh, store it somewhere else. But I'm getting a little bit afraid of that someone is going to do something to the to the trading of the gold. I don't believe that they will allow it just simply to to go up freely. You know, we. We have seen what they have done to the Swiss franc, and I mean, we're playing with some some tough people out there. What do you, what's your well? Opinion? Remember, there's a lot. There was a lot of pressure on Swiss politicians uh, to weaken the currency, and of course, it's very easy for Switzerland to weaken the franc. They just print them, but you're not going to have a big constituency out there to weaken gold. Uh, you know, and even if governments want to weaken gold, it's much more difficult because you can't print it. Yes, it's possible for some central bank to sell the gold that they have into the market. But the problem is there's so much demand, especially from other central banks, that if one central bank tried to depress the price of gold by selling it, it wouldn't even work. I mean, the gold would be quickly absorbed by the market, and the price, I think, would head higher. So 
while I think you do have competitive devaluations in the currency markets, I don't see it in the precious metals market. Meanwhile, gold prices have already gone up from $250 an ounce to $1,900 an ounce, and nothing has been done to impede uh, that rise. So I don't think that if, if, if gold goes from 1900 uh, to 3000 I don't think that that's going to change the dynamic. So I think if you're worried about the euro and you want to protect yourself in gold, just go ahead and do it. I mean, I, I you know. I'm just afraid that they're going to do something. You know, they're going to be trade for, for simple people or something. You know, but what's the alternative? You're afraid of something they might do that they haven't done yet. But what's the alternative? I mean, you're, you're going to lose money if you stick with your fiat currency. So I would suggest, you know, contacting my company, Euro Pacific uh, International, because not only can we buy gold for you, but we can store it and we can give you a, a MasterCard that you can use as a debit card uh, to access your gold. So if you need to spend it, if you need to go into an ATM machine and take out some cash, or if you want to go into a store and buy something, uh, you can pull out your Europac uh, MasterCard and uh, spend some of your gold. But it's not in uh, the U.S., is it? Uh, the, 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 the company, I say. No, no, it's in the Caribbean, but it's my company. Yeah, it's, 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 it's based out of the Caribbean. Uh, it's europacintl.com is the website, okay. and, you, you know, you can, you know. Just, just another yourself. question, Mr. Schiff, please. Uh, what happens in case of a failure of a bank, of a bankruptcy of a major bank in Europe? What happens? What do uh, people lose in it? Well, Does I am not familiar I'm not familiar with the, the, the Portuguese banking laws. I know here in the U.S. we have deposit insurance uh, where the government is obligated to make the depositor whole. Uh, they probably have something similar in Portugal, unfortunately. Um, uh, but, you know, uh, so chances are the depositors won't. Well, but, you know, what ultimately happens, though, is if you get a bunch of bank failures and the governments have to bail out the banks, where do they get the money? They create it. They print it. And so even though you still have your money, you lose a lot of your purchasing power. And that is what's more important. And so if you want to protect that, you do what you're thinking of, which is owning gold. Yeah. Okay. Well, All right. Thank you very much. And thanks for the call. And uh, glad to have people in, in Portugal listening to the Peter Schiff Show. Uh, next up is Bill calling from Mount Pleasant, uh, Pennsylvania. Bill, welcome to the show. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I'm a uh, subscriber and a uh, client and uh, a fan of yours and Ron Paul's. And I heard your uh, little talk about Ron Paul earlier, and I was disturbed the other day. I, there were a couple of criticisms I heard of Ron Paul, and I would wonder, I'm wondering if you would address them for me. The first one, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit here, is uh, I heard Mark Levin on the radio, and his he was going on and on about uh, – Ron Paul being a nut and that he surrounds himself with people who hated Lincoln and that if he, had, <laughs> if he had been in charge at that time that he would have allowed states to secede. Um, that was the first one. The second one was uh, I heard Hannity the other night said he could support just about all of the uh, conservative candidates except Ron Paul because he was really upset with the way he um, used Iran's uh, – getting a nuclear weapon. Apparently, Ron Paul <laughs> said that it wouldn't bother him. It wouldn't. Well, it not that it wouldn't bother him, but, uh, you know, the odds, you know, A, they don't even have one, and B, uh, what his point is that even if they were to develop one, um, you know, how, you know, what is the threat given the fact that the Soviet Union had intercontinental ballistic missiles uh, aimed at all of our cities, and they were, and, and they never launched them, and so, if we were able to to defend ourselves against, you know, the Soviet Union that actually could fire a missile and hit us, I mean, I, he's pointing out that Iran is simply not in a position to offer that type of threat, and I think he thinks that we are over, uh, overplaying it, and we're spending too much money and 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 uh, in overseas in order to defend against a threat that is really a, a lot smaller than what the media or what the government is making it out to be. And in that respect, he's probably right. And, of course, you know, if Iran were to develop a nuclear uh, weapon, I'm sure Israel would do something about it uh, <laughs> uh, very quickly without any, uh, without any uh, help from the United States. I think they're, uh, they have more at stake than we do, and I think they're in a position where they can uh, defend themselves. But as far as, uh, you know, obviously Ron Paul is not an idiot. He, he's far from an idiot. He's about as far from an idiot as you can come. Now, does he question and do a lot of people question some of Lincoln's decisions? With respect to the Civil War, absolutely. I mean, the Civil War, more Americans died in the Civil War than in World War One and World War II, uh, Vietnam, Korea combined. A tremendous loss of life. Was the Civil War really necessary? 
I don't think so. I think slavery would have ended even if we didn't have a civil war, and it would have ended with a lot less bloodshed, and it would have probably been better for the United States. So anyway, if you want to hang on, I'll continue uh, to discuss this a little bit more after the break. You're listening to The Peter Schiff Show here at ShiffRadio.com. <laughs> The Peter Schiff Show. To President Obama, Secretary Geithner, Madame Pelosi, and all of the socialist econ professors across America. We're sorry. We're sorry. Peter Schiff is back on the air. Yes, we are back, and I'm talking with Bill in uh, Pennsylvania about Ron Paul, a couple of controversial uh, uh, points regarding uh, Lincoln and I. I, uh, I ran and, and going back again to uh, the Civil War and, and you know a lot of people believe uh, mistakenly and probably the, it's the deliberate result of our school system that the Civil War was fought to end slavery that's not why it was fought it wasn't fought to end slavery in fact Lincoln himself said that if he could have uh, averted the war by preserving slavery he would have done it in fact the Emancipation Proclamation didn't come didn't happen until 1863. It was two years into the war before uh, Lincoln freed the slaves, and and one of the reasons he did that was there were rumors that the French might have intervened uh, on the side of the South, and and so in order to prevent that from happening, um, Lincoln wanted to turn the war into a war over slavery, uh, so that the French would then not be inclined to support the South if they turned it into a war. Uh, for slavery rather than what it started out to be, which was over states' rights. And and that's really what how the war began, and, and, and it wasn't. And that's why, you know, the, 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 the North, there wasn't a lot of support. They actually the, the, they had the drafts. In fact, the bloodiest riots in U.S. history took place uh, during those drafts. But the South, everybody volunteered. There was no draft, draft in the Confederacy. Uh, people volunteered. Uh, so uh, th- 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 there were a lot of problems, you know, and and, and – but it's very unpopular when somebody comes back and, and criticizes what happened during that time period. It was a very dark period in American history. Clearly, we would have been better off as a nation had we ended slavery without the bloodshed of the Civil War and without a lot of the damage. You know, the first income tax happened during the Civil War. It went away, but it came back. The first paper money happened during the Civil War. So a lot of bad precedences were started during that time period. America would certainly be better off uh, without them. So I do think it, you know, uh, rational people can question a lot of the decisions that were made back then. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, the media likes to demagogue it. And somehow, if you have any problem with that, with the war, that you, you were in favor of slavery, which clearly Ron Paul uh, is not. Um, you know, also on the the Iraq comments, you know, I had a, a different spin on it, and I disagree a little bit with uh, with Ron Paul on on Iran. It's not a big deal for me, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think that the U.S. if we had credible intelligence that Iran was uh, uh, developing a nuclear weapon, I think that the United States should do something about it. I think we could do something about it without having the massive military presence that we have today. Look, clearly, had we been able to prevent the Soviet Union from developing uh, nuclear weapons, we should have done it. You know, clearly uh, we would have been better off if we could have avoided the Cold War. And in fact, there was a discussion. Uh, there was uh, an opinion among uh, many. Uh, you know, General Patton comes to mind that you know when we finished defeating the Nazis and we were, we had our tanks and our troops in Europe uh, to then go and and, and go to uh, Moscow and and liberate uh, Russia and defeat the communists because people like General Patton understood that it wasn't just the Nazis that were our enemies but the communists in Russia but but uh, Truman uh, you know Truman wouldn't do it Truman wouldn't support it but you know so I I do think that we would have been better off had we nipped that in the bud. Uh, and I, I think that, yes, is it possible that Iran could develop a nuclear weapon and ultimately use it against us? Yes, it's possible. And if for a relatively small expenditure we could eliminate that possibility, it's something that I think is worth doing. But, again, I don't think we necessarily have to do it because I think if we don't do it, Israel will do it, and that's just as good. I mean, they're, they're right there, and they have the capability uh, to, to uh, neutralize that threat. So. Oh. Uh, anyway, is Bill still there? One other comment, Peter, uh, and that is... Uh, I, know, I thought I still had the caller on the line. I guess he dropped out. But anyway, hopefully I thoroughly uh, answered his uh, question. Anyway, I'm moving on to Ellen uh, calling in from New York. Ellen, you're on. Hi. Hi, Peter. Um, I'm a Euro-Pacific client. Is Ellen there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? 
Can you hear me? Maybe we're having a problem with these callers. Uh, let me move on to Tony in Las Vegas. Hello? Tony, are you there? Is anybody hearing me? All right, I'll go to Kevin in Toronto. Cool. Is Kevin there? Yeah, yeah. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Hello? All right. All right, apparently I can't hear any of the callers. I don't know why, um, you know, what is wrong with my equipment. I'm not hearing any of the callers. Um, so I don't know um, um, what what the callers are calling about. Um, I'll try I'll try to adv- address some of the cop- topics. I mean, Tony in Las Vegas apparently was calling uh, regarding decoupling. I mean, decoupling is, is something that uh, I believe is going on. It's the whole concept where the rest of the world will decouple from the U.S. economy. And, you know, the idea is, you know, most people regard the U.S. economy as being the engine uh, of the global economic train. I regard it as the caboose, and that's why I think the decoupling process uh, is so advantageous for the rest of the world because they no longer have to pull uh, the caboose uh, behind them. I think the world is dragging a lot of dead weight because Americans are consuming but not producing, borrowing and not saving, and our spending is not a benefit that the world enjoys. It's a burden that the world has to bear. But, of course, this whole decoupling process, there are certain factions uh, that benefit from the status quo, that make a lot of noise, that have a lot of political collection, connections. And so politicians are, are doing things uh, to uh, to protect those interests, so the decoupling process doesn't happen quickly and automatically. It is happening over time. It is taking time. But if you look around and if you look at the emerging markets and a lot of the economies that are really the kaboot, that the engine that are pulling the global economic train, their economies are doing much better uh, than than the U.S. Despite the, the 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 efforts of their governments to impede that progress. Uh, through exchange controls and currency pegs and money printing that are trying to preserve the status quo as opposed to recognizing that the status quo is a raw, quo is a raw deal, right, that, that the world is getting ripped off in this relationship and that by allowing the dollar to collapse, allowing their own currencies to gain in value, they no longer have to export so much because they can simply consume what they produce. Again, the, the reason that, that, that you export – is not so you can export. You export so you can import something else. But if you're making everything yourself and you don't need to import, then why are you exporting? Why are you denying your own citizens the enjoyment of, of that production? Right? You, you, it's, it, uh, the Chinese would get a much more enjoyment. They'd, they'd enjoy a much higher living standard if they could keep their products rather than our paper money. Because after all, we get the products and they get our paper. Uh, but they, we, you know, we get much more economic utilization from the products that they produce than they get for the money that they get from the money that we print. In fact, what do they do with the money that we print? They just they just stack it up. They just store it and they use it to buy treasuries. And we pay them interest and they buy more treasuries. And now they've got, you know, a mountain that, you know, that would reach up up up, up into the heavens uh, of all this paper money. Meanwhile, we're, you know, we're we're enjoying uh, all this stuff. We're wearing their clothes, we're using their electronics, we're sitting in their furniture. We're we're we're, we're getting a lot of use, a lot of economic utility out of the things that they're giving us, uh, but they're not getting the same enjoyment out of the things that we give them. In fact, if they stopped trading, if they kept their stuff, uh, then they would get all the enjoyment and we would get uh, our own inflation. Anyway, that said, I apologize for the technical difficulties that screwed up the calls here at the end of the show. So don't forget, watch the presidential debate tonight. We will be back again tomorrow with another two hours of the Peter Schiff Show here on ShiffRadio.com, the gold standard in talk radio. Bye, folks. The Peter Schiff Show.